As a kid growing up, we had this old amusement park on the outskirts of our town that had been abandoned for more than a decade. I remember that I used to be so jealous of my parents who actually got to hang out there all of the time while it was still up and running. I had only ever seen it when it was shut down and sort of overgrown, but still the rides and attractions looked like they would have been a blast. But just because my friends and I didn't get to spend time there while it was open doesn't mean that the park wasn't home to a few memories of our own. Sadly, not all of them are as funny as Austin getting attacked by a raccoon. In fact, the most prominent memory that I have still haunts my dreams every now and then. It was the summer of 01, and a few of my friends had planned a small camp out within the amusement park to play an epic game of hide and seek. We had done it once before during the previous summer, and it was so much fun, and there were so many good places to hide that we couldn't pass up the opportunity again. That year, we came a little bit more prepared and actually brought some sleeping bags and supplies to make it through the night. When we all met up, there was still about an hour of daylight left, so we decided to do a quick walk around to see what hiding spots we might be able to come up with for ourselves. And during that time, we all studied the park really well. I mean, I could tell you exactly how a bunch of stacked boxes looked. Just in case someone chose to hide there, I would notice if they had moved any of the boxes. And honestly, us studying the park as much as we did was the only reason that we knew there was someone else there with us that night. After about an hour of looking around, we all made our way back to the base camp and decided to snack and unwind before drawing straws to see who the two seekers were. Lucky for me, I was one of the seven people hiding, and I knew exactly where I was going to go. There was an old carousel that had a gap in the overhanging awning that I knew I could hide in as long as it would support me. As soon as it was time, I quickly and quietly made my way over to the carousel, but on my way, I noticed that there was a door to the House of Mirrors opened that wasn't open before. I chuckled to myself, thinking that I had already figured out where someone else was hiding, and continued to the carousel and stashed myself away. Thankfully, the awning supported me. I stayed as quiet as I could and listened for anyone who may have been coming my way, and for about 15 minutes there was nothing but silence. But that silence was quickly broken by the sound of someone laughing somewhere over to the right of me. It sounded like they were about 10 feet away from the carousel, and I was pretty sure that they couldn't see me because I couldn't see them. I did my best to stay quiet, but as the laughter drew closer, I started to get the chills. I didn't recognize the sound of the laughing, so I really wasn't sure who it was. All I knew was that they were walking straight toward me, which was when I realized that they must have known where I was. I began to hold my breath as they drew closer, and the laughter grew louder and started to sound almost sinister. That was when I heard my friend Peter in the distance say that he thought he heard something, which was followed by the sound of him running in my direction. The sound of Peter running toward us must have scared whoever it was off because I could hear them head in the opposite direction. At that point, I just gave myself up and called out for Peter to let him know that I was coming down. The first thing I asked him when I saw him was if he saw whoever it was that was laughing over there, and sadly he didn't. That was when we heard Jamie screaming in the distance, which sent both of us in a full-fledged sprint toward her. We found her standing in the middle of the park looking as if she had seen a ghost. She started to say that she thought someone was following her, and then explained that she heard someone laughing from the shadows near her, which made her scream and run. It was then that we called out for everyone, and decided to call it quits and just spend the night in Peter's backyard. It's strange. We all had strange things happen to or around us that night. Like one of our friends said he heard someone running up the stairs to one of the big slides in the park, and another said he saw a stack of tin cans in a booth that wasn't there when we were looking around earlier. But other than that, none of us ever saw who was in the park with us or figured out why they were following us around. It sure was a night we would never forget, though. When I was younger, I used to only live one street over from my best friend Javel, and what made it even better was that I didn't even have to walk along the road to get to his house. 
Instead, we had this abandoned amusement park that was right across the street from his house, and one of its fences actually bordered my backyard, so we used to just cut through there all the time. It was really convenient, especially when it was dark out. The main road was always super busy at night, and I wouldn't have wanted to get hit by a car, though I would end up switching to taking the long way home as I got older. It was back when I was 12 years old. I had just finished spending the day over at Javel's house, and it was actually past the time that I was supposed to be home, so when I finally left and began walking home, it was more like speed walking because I was in a rush. I quickly crossed the street and made my way through the giant gap in the front gate and into the abandoned amusement park. As I said, my house wasn't far. I just had to walk toward the middle of the park and then veer right past the bumper cars and then it was a simple hop over the fence. But that night, as soon as I entered the park, I heard the sound of someone's feet scuffing the ground behind me. It took me off guard and I stopped dead in my tracks with my eyes opened wide. I listened closely, and that was when I heard the unmistakable sound of someone's footsteps slowly approaching. Everything in me told me not to look, but I couldn't help but turn my head to look over my shoulder. That was when I confirmed that I wasn't alone in the park. Standing about four yards behind me was someone who appeared to be wearing a plain white mask. They stopped walking forward as soon as I looked at them. I could feel the cold rush of chills running through my body as I stared back at whoever it was. They may have been far away, and it may have been dark out, but it was like I was making direct eye contact with them. My eyes widened as their head cocked to the side. They took a single step toward me, which caused me to let out a gasp. I was frozen in place from fear, but thankfully my fight-or-flight instincts kicked in and as my masked pursuer began to advance toward me, I took off running. It was a path I had taken literally dozens of times, so navigating through the park was like second nature to me, even including the fact that I was looking over my shoulder more than I was looking ahead of me. I finally made it to the bumper cars and quickly wrapped around them to the stack of crates that I used to hop the fence, and honestly, that was the fastest that I had ever been able to pull myself over it. As soon as I landed on the other side, I was in my backyard. I began screaming my head off as I ran up my back porch and into my house. After locking the door behind me, I ran into the living room to tell my mom what had just happened. She told my father about the incident, and he made sure to lock the house up extra tight that night, and the following day we went to the police station to file the report. I still don't know who that person in the white mask was or why they were following me. But after that, the police closed the gate at the front of the park, and I was forced to walk along the road on my way home from Javel's, though I probably would have done that anyways after what happened. There was never much we could do in the town where I grew up in. A lot of us just spent our time hanging out climbing trees and hiking through the woods, but on those rainy days every now and then we would sneak into the abandoned amusement park off the side of the highway. One night we were all hanging out extra late and we ended up sneaking into the park even though it hadn't rained in a few weeks. We wanted to hang out in our secret club that we made in one of the old fun houses that we had managed to work our way into. We spent a lot of time there, so it was all set up with cushions and stuff that we had all brought there ourselves, so we knew they weren't super disgusting and we even had candles for it when it was too dark to see, so it was perfect. Or so we thought. When we first showed up at our little hideout, we closed the door behind us, and just as we did, we heard a loud banging sound, and then something fell right on the other side of the door. It sounded like a piece of siding from the funhouse, but no matter what it was, it was clearly blocking our only way out of our hideout. We try not to freak out, and decided to light one of the candles while we looked for another way out. After lighting it, I handed the candle over to Alex, who was clearly shaken up by the fact that we were all trapped. We tried to tell her that we were going to be okay, and all she needed to do was relax, but other than that, there was nothing we could do to calm her down aside from finding a way out. So that's what we started to do. I started touching all of the walls to feel if there was any sort of weak point, 
while Jordan went to see if we could get upstairs to climb out one of the windows. I had no luck with the walls, and they all seemed solid to me. The rest of us were silent as we waited for Jordan to come back, but that silence was broken by another loud crash that made all of us jump. That was when Jordan came stumbling in, saying that he tripped over a wooden board before explaining that the door to the upstairs section of the fun house was locked. And before I could even get a sentence out, I noticed how wide his eyes were. Something had struck him with fear. Just like that, we all realized what he had noticed. When we all got scared from Jordan tripping, the candle must have gotten knocked out of Alex's hands and she didn't realize it. The cushions on the floor had caught fire and the dried out funhouse walls behind it quickly followed. There was no time to snuff it out when we realized that the room we were all stuck in was now on fire. We all started to panic as we frantically searched for another way out of the funhouse. As Jordan and Alex tried to put the fire out by stomping on it and pouring the two water bottles that we had on it, I remembered the board Jordan had tripped on. The water did nothing to douse the flames, and they had quickly begun to crawl up the wall of the funhouse by the time I was calling out to Jordan to go grab me the board. He quickly ran to it and brought it back to me, which is when I started using the board of wood to stab at the wall that was on the other side of the room from the fire. The room was quickly filling with smoke as I continued to hit the wall as hard as I could. To our surprise, the wall started to give a little bit, which was when I put the board down and told Jordan to run at it with me. The two of us counted to three and sprinted at the weakened wall of the flaming funhouse as fast as we could before throwing ourselves at it. Thankfully, we managed to burst through it, and all of us managed to make it out of the room alive. We all had to ditch by the time the fire department got there, and as to not get in trouble, we never told any of our parents about it.